today we're going to paint this little spring daisy banner, which I painted several times. Initially I'd done it on this little um, window topper that has, it's made out of MDF, and it has some Battenberg lace detail at the bottom that's cut out. I've been having a difficult time getting this piece. It ca originally came from Coyote Woodworks in Canada, and I know they've kind of re- have new ownership and it's just not as easy to import the things in from them as I used to. So I have reworked the design and prepared it on some other surfaces that are similar but a little different. Um, I've painted it here on a larger banner that's about 10 by 15 and it also has a ribbon topper that gives you a, a nice large welcome sign. And since it didn't have the, the detailed lace work at the bottom that's cut out. I, I just painted it to mimic what the uh, MDF sign had at the bottom and thought that looked pretty nice with just the lace work here. So I've just recently had a new piece cut for the pattern and this is cut out of 1 8 inch birch plywood which is a real nice smooth surface and I've had it special cut with some uh, laser work at the bottom to mimic some Battenberg lace. So, you know, this is my design and, you know, it's similar to the other original Coyote Woodwork piece, but, you know, I wanted something that was more original. It's a little bigger. And I also have a ribbon banner topper to go with it. So we're going to repaint the Daisy Spring Basket on this wood piece today. So let's get started. You know, what you'll need is some kind of surface. You don't necessarily have to have the specific surface. Any, you can paint it on a canvas or any type of wood piece, a wood box or a, you know, a rock lawn banner. So many things. This design will work on so many things. But the prep for the birch plywood piece is um, fairly simple. I like to start out with a multi-purpose sealer. I use either the DecoArt Traditions multi-purpose sealer or um, another alternative is the Americana multi-purpose sealer. I find them to be pretty similar and in quality and I use them kind of interchangeably so it, it doesn't matter which one you use. Because this design has all this cutout, laser cutouts at the bottom, it's real easy to get the liquid base coats caught up in these little crevices and corners. So what I found worked best to prevent that was to tear off a small piece of cellulose sponge. This is one of those little round sponges that you can get in a pack and I just broke off a corner and you know dipped it in some of the multi-purpose sealer. Just lightly wipe it on the surface. Um, you don't want a whole lot so you don't get a lot of residue here in this cutout part. You're going to let that dry, and once it's dry, because this is a wood surface, the grain will sometimes raise a little bit and feel a little rough. So take some type of sanding pad. You want a real fine one, either a sanding film, or I like these little oval sanding pads that you can get in various um, coarseness. And this one's one of the really fine ones. So you're just going to really lightly sand with the grain to smooth that sealed, sealed surface back down. Then you're going to repeat the same thing, but you're going to base coat it with DecoArt Americana Sand, which is a, a soft cream color that almost looks like the natural wood. You don't see a whole lot of difference in it, but it's a nice soft background for these flowers. So again, you're going to use the sponge, dip a little, the sponge in a little bit of the paint. You're going to wipe it on, avoiding getting any excess down in this cut work. And then let it dry and re-sand with the sanding pad. Because again, you'll, you'll get a little bit of the grain raising back up. And your painting will get, go on much smoother and all your detail work is a lot easier to do when you have a really super smooth surface. So you can prepare your surface and get to this point and then we'll come back and start the basket. The next step you'll want to do is to transfer your pattern. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. One is to, I guess the more traditional way is to transfer your design, your line pattern to 
a piece of tracing paper, which is a, a kind of a transparent, thinner film that you can then put on your surface and kind of see where you're going to position it. But I was lazy, and I just printed my copy on a laser printer, and I'm just laying the page on the, pa on the piece of wood and kind of positioning it so the basket is evenly placed from left to right. And then I, you can either, you know, put a little piece of scotch tape to hold it in place, or I just ran my finger along the edges to create a crease so I could keep my, my line drawing position straight. After that, you want to slide either, you know, if you're using just the printed version or a, a tracing paper piece, you're going to trans place a piece of graphite paper in between the pattern and the wood. And you want to position the paper so that, you know, it's going to cover all of the design that you're transferring. And then use a stylus or an old ballpoint pen or anything will also work. And you're going to go around the lines of the pattern to transfer it to the surface. Now initially we're just going to transfer the basket design because it would be too difficult to paint this design and work around all these flowers and stuff when you're doing the basket. So we're just going to transfer the whole basket and then once we get that painted we'll come back and transfer the pattern for the flowers and all the other little details. So you can see here I've actually transferred the basket design and I'll bring it up here closer to the camera so you can see, you know, you just want some kind of lines that you can see but sort of faint so that they're not too harsh to cover and at that point we're ready to start painting. So I'm going to stop now and let you get to this position to this spot in the the design and then we'll come back and work on the basket. Okay, we're back from getting our surface ready to go and I want to show you what we'll be using to paint the first step of the design. Um, what I like to paint with is I store my paints in a Masterson's Stay Wet palette. This is just a small one that's nice for when I'm working on a class, but you can see it's a little plastic container. It's got a layer of a, you know, a thin cellulose sponge that's soaked in water. And then it has a sheet of palette paper, and this is a special palette paper for the Stay Wet palettes because it's it's not wax coated. The water um, absorbs through it, so it's it's almost sort of like a a butcher paper. But you soak your sponge in water, wet, crumple and wet the palette paper, lay it on top and smooth it out. Make sure you have all the bubbles out of the surface. If you have bubbles, that tends to, to dry the paper. And you want to keep that paper nice and moist. And then when you put your paints on it, it will keep your paints moist. And if you have to stop and want to move away from your painting for a while, you can put your cover on it and it'll keep your paints. And there's times that I've used the same palette for up to a month or so without having to put new paint on unless I've actually used up the paint. You also want a wax palette. A wax palette is usually comes in a pad and it's a, it's a waxy sheet of paper that uh, won't absorb the water. So it's really good for water-based paints like acrylics or you can even use oils on this, but the paint won't absorb down into the paper. It, it rests on top and I use this for loading my brushes when I want to do floats or mixed colors, things like that. So we'll have a, a wax palette. I'm going to use a couple of brushes for this working on the basket. I'm using a number 12 flat, just if I need to dampen the surface, I'm going to keep that as a clean water brush and a half inch angle. And then we're going to use some raw umber. I'm using Traditions Raw Umber Acrylic. And when we're working on a, a grisaille painting like we're doing with this basket, you are 
working in just one color. The word grisaille is a French word for gray, which um, this is an old technique that has been around for hundreds of years, and typically you'll see artists use it they'll be painting in shades of gray from black to white and you know all the values in between but you can also use umbers for your underpainting and the reason I like to use the umbers especially on a project like this where the baskets in, in golds and browns and stuff the umbers are just a little bit warmer than if you use the black underpainting and it just adds some warmth to your your project so you're going to put out a little bit of of the burnt, I'm sorry, the raw umber on your palette. And the one thing really great about the Traditions paints is you don't have to shake them. They don't separate like some of the other craft acrylics do. And I hate shaking bottles of paint. but So we're just putting a little bit out on the wet palette. And we'll have our, our wax palette here with it. You can position it, you know, however you like to work. You're going to need a water container. Uh, again, there's all kinds of water containers available in the market, and you can use something even as simple as a, a margarine tub. But, you know, the water pallets, water tubs that are actually made for painting have different compartments in them, so they're nice to, you, you can keep a clean area of paint, water, and there's some ridges in the bottom of the one section that are good for cleaning your brushes out if you need a little bit of extra scrubbing power but you just have to be careful because you won't don't want to damage your your brushes on those ridges but I'll set the water here off camera so you don't see it but you'll know it's there so we've got our project here and we're working on this little basket and Basket weaves, uh, basket woven baskets have just a lot of shading and highlights. So you can see we've got shading on each side of these little um, bands that weave in and out of the basket. So you just need to be consistent on which direction you're placing your shading. So, for instance, if we take this this strip across the middle. This one here would go above, and it starts tucking under the next band that goes the opposite direction. So we're going to shade where it goes under, and then shade where it comes out from under. And you're going to do that on each one. So I find it easiest to work everything in one direction, and then we'll turn around and work everything in the opposite direction so you're not working in wet paint. So um, sit, I'm going to set this over to the side, and we'll start here on this this band here, and that one I have have going under this one. So the way I like to side load is I I dampen my brush. I probably use a little more water than most of some artists do. I find if I slide the brush down the side of the the water container, if you can see this. So I'm pressing against the side and just running the brush down in. That seems to control how much water goes in the brush. You don't want it totally just dripping with water, but you want a pretty good amount of water. A lot of artists will dip it in and then touch it on a paper towel to remove some of the water, but I found this method works best for me. Then you will tip the corner and I'm using the long end of the angle brush, the what they sometimes call the toe, and I'm just putting a little triangle of paint on there. And then you're going to work on your wax palette and brush in one direction and I always try to keep that very straight. You can work it back and forth a little bit, but you want to keep the short end of the brush out of the paint. You want that to have just clear water but you're trying to transition that paint from a lot of paint strength on the long toe over to plain water on the heel of the brush. I'm going to flip that over and work the opposite direction in the same track. And what you're going to see on your palette is what you're going to see on your surface when you apply that paint. 
So I'm going to work over here and I'm putting the paint edge right against that line and this is going to shade where that band of the, the basket goes under weaves under the next one. And you can see I don't I don't try to do a float in one solid. I'll I'll do little short strokes across and then I'll go back and soften it all together if I need to. Now on some surfaces you'll find that um, they really absorb the water. So that's why I'm keeping the clean brush. If I, I find my surface is really dry and seems to absor absorb a lot of water, I'll dampen that area before I put my float down. So we're going to skip a block and come over to the next one. And if I put just some clean water, just brush that on the surface. When I go to put my float down, it's damp, and that paint will spread a little easier. It won't get that dry brushed look. So we've got a couple couple of the bands started on this layer, so we'll skip up to the next one, the, the next row, and you're going to, it's almost like a checkerboard, you're going to do the ones in between the next row. So we'll skip this row where this shading was and go up to this next one. Like I said, it's sort of like a checkerboard. I'm going to wet two of these squares with some plain water and let that set up a second. And actually I can go ahead and do this one, I think. So I've got three, three of the squares dampened with water. I reload my side load or float and I very seldom clean my brush out as I'm floating. I just, as long as I work in that same track, I can add a little more water or a little more paint as I need to. And so then we're going to go up to the next row that are already dampened and put down a float of color. And you can see we're, we're creating this checkerboard look. So go to the next one and then the next one. What's really nice about doing this grisaille method, I find it very relaxing because you don't really have to think too hard, you're just working in values of one color. You want um, to work all your... When I say values, it's the light, lightness or darkness of a color. So we're, we're just going to work in various values of this umber. And part of the values we're developing are because of the floated color. You've got dark and it's, sh it's shading down to a lighter value. So you've got a stronger, darker value at the edge. And as you float, the float moves towards the center, the value softens. So that's how you're creating your color values. But it's a lot easier than trying to work, worry about a lot of different colors and values of different colors as you're painting when you're working in the, the umbers. You just have one color and all you have to do is worry about the values of that color. So we've got two rows done and we're going to go to the next row.
So as you can see, we've got a start of a basket, and each of these squares is shaded in almost a checkerboard pattern. So this first row that we've worked on should be dry. So on those same squares or bands that we've did the first shading, we need to go back and shade on the opposite edge because that's where the band goes underneath. I'm not even sh I'm not sure what to call these bands on a basket. I know there's probably a technical term for them, but I'm just adding a little water to that row. That was the first row that we did. And I'm going to go back and see I'm here's the shading on this edge of the square. I'm going to go put my paint to the opposite edge and we're going to shade this opposite side. Smooth that out. And as you start building up these shadows, you'll start it'll actually start looking like a dimensional basket weave. And you can see as you know, since this side is shaded and this side is shaded and it's lighter in the middle, it gives the effect of the weave coming up. So we're going to go to the next row again. Dampen this a little here and a little here and we've got a little triangle area out on the edge and when you do this you need to really make sure that the the float on the opposite side of that square is dry if, if it was still wet and you tried to float over top the opposite side the clear water end of your brush would just wipe that paint away so be sure that the first layers that you would put in are dry before you go to the opposite side of the band. A little corner. Let's see, and we've got just a little spot right here. In that row. We're going to jump up to this third row here. we've got pretty much everything shaded going in that direction. So now we need to stop and work on the opposite bands. So I'm going to stop and clean my brush out a second and let this dry and then we'll come back. Okay, we're back and this first layer is dried, so we're going to start shading the the checkerboard part that we haven't painted yet. So you can see where the ones that we've shaded are the ones that are running up and down at a diagonal from top right to bottom left. Now we're going to do the shading on the ones that run from top left to bottom right. I know, I know this is a little confusing to understand and I think I'll try to zoom in a little bit closer. <clears throat> okay, so again if we start in this middle row, this middle square that we've got shaded on left and right, the one to below it is going to be shaded in the opposite direction because it's running underneath this one. So we want to shade along this top edge and the bottom edge. So we're going to, again, dampen 
the bands with some clean water and we will load our brush with some more raw umber and shade this direction. Okay, we've done that one, so we'll go up to this next square. And you can come along this one, actually shade here underneath the the rim of the basket along that top edge. We'll move over to the one to the right. Again, dampen the weave. Load the brush with a little more paint and shade across against the one that was already shaded. And then down to the next one. Move to the next row. We only have one in this row to add some water to. I'm put a little more paint on the brush. Well, that one I probably got a little too much paint, so I'm going to just wipe a little off the edge. Again, you can start you can really start seeing the dimension of the basket weave. So when these first ones are dry again, I find it easiest to turn the board upside down and start working and we're gonna dampen this row and we're gonna float the opposite direction. And you can see now we've got all of our basket weaves a first coat in, and it has a real dimensional look of a woven basket. Now I'm going to work a little bit on the rim, and let me see, I'll turn it around so the handle's going up again. And you're going to do the same thing, but there's not as many areas to float. We're going to float here where this little the rim overlaps as it's wrapped around and it's riveted together and we're going to do a little shading out on the outside edges. So I'm going to dampen all those down. I'm loading my brush a with a little more paint. And we're going to float around that little curved area and we're going to float on the outer edge of each side. 
that will give your and you can walk it out by running down the edge step out maybe a eighth of an inch and float again and that will widen your float so it, it's spread out over a little wider area it's not right on the edge do that a couple times and then you're going to do the same thing on the opposite side and you can see I've been able to do this I have enough water and paint in my brush that I haven't had to reload So there we are on the base of our basket shading. I'm, I'm seeing there's one little corner right here that needs a little shading where it goes under this, this reed. So it's just it's almost next to nothing. Now the handle is so narrow that you don't need to do a lot of shading. I'm going to switch to a, a quarter inch angle and, or you could use a quarter inch or a, a small flat and we're just going to add a little bit of shading on the handle just to give it a little variation although there's really not a lot of detail to it and it's going to be covered with a lot of flowers so I'm just going to run this angle brush sort of up the inside edge on each side just to I'm almost standing the brush on end because the brush is too wide for the handle I just want to have it a little variation in color and you can do a little around the top See, see where you can see. I've just ran a little here, and a little, little around each side. I'm going to zoom back out again, so you can see the overall thing. So now. This is the, again, the beauty of the grisaille. You've done all your shading and we've only used two colors, the raw umber and the background color of sand. Now what I would do next is go back and repeat on the shading on these, these, um, these weaves where I feel like I need a little bit stronger shadow. And on this time I might switch and use the quarter inch angle so my float's a little bit narrower so for instance, and I, I won't even put water down on these, I'll just come back and strengthen those floats. And because you know where they are all at now and you're working with a quarter inch brush, you can just do them all at once because your brush isn't too wide. It won't, it won't get into what the wet paint on the opposite side of that band. So let's just go back and just reinforce all of these and you don't have to do them in any certain direction just just um, put a second layer on everything it's easier this time because the first time it's it's trying to figure out where where your shading goes but now that we've got all the shading in it's easy just to to go over top of it So I'll do a couple of these and then we'll take a break and you can go back and work on all of your shading doing a at least second and if you feel like you need a third layer to clean it up and again you're just working in the raw umber just reinforcing those shadows so that you get a lot of variation in color so you can see there it's it's getting very dimensional 
So we're going to take a break and we'll be back when we finish adding that second or third layer of shading on the, the basket weave. Okay, we're um, back after doing two or three layers of the floats of raw umber on the basket. And I'm going to brush just a, a clear coat of glazing medium over. I'm just going to start right now with the bottom part of the basket so it doesn't dry too fast. And the glazing medium you can mix with your paint and because it's about the same consistency as the paint and it's clear you can create paint that's even more transparent than what it might normally be out of the bottle. Raw sienna is semi-transparent so it's not quite as clear as the Indian yellow. So a little glazing medium will help that raw sienna to become a little more transparent. If your glazing medium is drying too quick, a smaller, yeah, see when you brush it on the palette that color is very transparent. And then if we brush that over the bottom of the basket, we start building up a little more golden color on the basket, but because the color is transparent, you see all of your shading through it. So those values that you put down give more dimension to the, keep the dimension of the basket and the glazed color gives the color to the basket. So we're going to work that over the entire basket and just kind of do a smooth coat and then do the same thing to the rim. Since the rim's a smaller area and I'm seeing this color is really transparent, I'm not even going to put a coat of the glazing medium down first. I'm just going to brush this color right over the, the band rim around the basket. and do some on the handle. If you feel more comfortable, you could switch to a smaller brush to do the handle. I'm just putting the, running the um, angle brush up on kind of the chisel edge to fill that basket handle in so I don't have to change brushes. So I'm going to stop just for a minute and dry this with a hair dryer. Okay, I stepped aside and dried the basket down with a hair dryer. Um, you can tell it's dry when it loses its gloss and it was obviously going to feel warm from the hair dryer, but if you let it sit a second, if there's any wet spots, if you touch it, they'll feel cold. So we're going to brush just one more even coat on. And that gives the basket kind of that soft golden color. It's a little darker than the background. Okay, so there you can see we've got a nice golden basket color. So let's stop one more time and dry again with a hair dryer just to speed up the process.
and I will be right back. Okay, our second coat of the raw sienna is dried, and I want to add a little brighter yellow to the basket to perk up the color a little bit. So we're going to use some of the Indian yellow, and I'm going to put a little bit of the glazing medium on my brush, and the brush is damp to start with, and we're going to side load the brush with the Indian yellow and float some of that color along the edges. And you can see where that just brightens up when it goes over top of the raw sienna. So on, on the weaves I'm going to just float across some of the the lighter side. If you need a little more paint, just pick up some more on your brush. You don't need to clean it. Let's see, let's do some on this one. You don't have to do it on every edge. I'm just picking here and there to just to vary the color a little bit. You can run a, a little bit around the hand. There's some background color behind where we have the daisies and leaves inside the basket. And so we're going to put some of that dirty green in right now just and let that dry before we transfer the f designs for or the line drawings for the basket flowers and the bees and things. So what we're using is a little bit of phthalo blue which is a very bright blue. And because I like to work with a limited palette, we're going to stick with the colors that we've already been using. So you can make a real nice green out of just a touch of the phthalo blue. And I'm going to pick a, a dirty green that you know you like the shade of. If you want it to be more blue, you can leave more blue. If you want it to be more of a yellowish green, just keep adding more of the, the raw sienna. And then we're just going to sort of slip slap center of the basket back, loosely filling the And you want some variation in the color so you can pity pat it and get kind of a mottled variation in the... Mm -hmm. 